thanks for um, thanks for coming back. Um, so uh, just perhaps just to remind you, so I have got the slides that um, I'm using here online on, on, on the, my page, but I've also already seen they're also on the conference web page. So also for this lecture. So if you want to just follow along while uh, I'm talking, if I go too fast or too slow, you can kind of peruse them at your own pace. And then also just to reiterate what I said last week. So if there's ever a question or something that you want to well, discuss with me, then please just send me an email. All right, um, so let's go back to the outline of the course, what I wanted to do and where we were. So uh, on Monday, I dis discussed in quite a bit of detail with you this toy case. So the, I discussed the um, this mean field easing or the Kruger Weiss model and uh, how you can, uh, the main point was that uh, you could derive a nonlinear, non not stochastic PDE, but a nonlinear ODE, stochastic ODE, uh, from that, if you kind of uh, tune your parameter right around the critical point, and I'll just repeat that in a minute quickly. And then uh, for today, the plan is now to reintroduce uh, spatial coordinates. So we're going to talk about this cuts easing thing, and I've at least formally derive an SPDE. And then, as I said, uh, so I'll do a quick primer on these these five four theories and continue in, in, in continuum, and uh, also discuss scaling uh, and discuss this notion of subcriticality and how different dimensions enter. And then uh, on tomorrow, I'll tell you, as I said already before, I'll go further to stochastic integrals and continuum and bound the trees. And then uh, let's see how far I get on Friday. Just a, a quick reminder of, of what we did on Monday. So because, uh, I mean, I always need to reload in my brain what we had. So I, I presume you may be the same. Uh, so we talked about this uh, mean field easing model, which was just a uh, yeah, I mean, again, an easing model where the interaction is given with uh, everything interacts with everything, easing model on the complete graph, and you have just this interaction action strength of one over n. And we had looked at the global dynamics, which was given by this formula here, and we had then uh, reformulated this in this convenient way. And uh, what was quite nice here is that uh, you could see that this jump rate could actually be written mostly in terms of the, the mean magnetization. So uh, then once we went to... Um, uh, once we went to apply this generator to it, so this is always a good idea when one look at, looks at these kind of systems, one uh, decomposes the observable one is interested into a drift term and the, the, the noise martingale term. And then we had uh, for this uh, generator, we had an almost closed expression for this M up to the small error term. And uh, the martingale, we characterized that we had seen that the jump size was uh, pretty small. And uh, the predictable quadratic variation is uh, kind of a measure to the uh, uh, to get uh, the noise, to, to measure the noise strength, we had calculated was of order two over n. So uh, this then said, well, it's a reasonable approximation actually to say that the mean magnetization is governed by this stochastic ODE with this noise term here, uh, which is smaller than the drift term. And uh, then from there, I had analyzed. So let's just ignore the uh, let's just ignore the uh, the noise term. So if we just crash that and we look at how this ODE behaves, and I just do a Taylor approximation for this tunge. And then you see that there's three different regimes. If you look at the high temperature regime, which amounts to beta small, you get kind of this thing that well, looks basically like a linear function. So the sort of the magnetization converges to zero exponentially. And uh, then in this uh, low temperature regime, we had this opposite. So zero was actually a repelling fixed point. And then you, the solutions are attracted either to the, depending on where you start with positive or negative sign to this minus spontaneous magnetization or positive spontaneous magnetization. And then there was this interesting critical case, if you let's just set beta equal to one, where you have this very, I mean, still zero is a fixed point, but the convergence to zero is extremely much more slowly than it would be here in this, uh, in this situation. And then I had talked a bit about fluctuation, but most importantly, I had uh, said, well, what happens if you look at the fluctuations near this point beta equal to one? And uh, I had chosen this particular scaling. So I had allowed my beta to be in this critical window uh, of, of order one over n to a half around one. And I had rescaled this, um, rescaled my magnetization like that. So I have on the one hand side blown it up with a factor n to a half, but at the same time, I um, also accelerated time with this factor n to a quarter. And very important, and I had discussed this a little bit, that the way this, this I would want to state this theorem is that I assume that uh, the initial datum converges. So this is, uh, in particular, this theorem as, as such does not yet uh, um, uh, imply the convergence of the invariant measures. So this is really convergence of, if you want, the Markov processes. 
But if you make these assumptions, then we do get uh, this convergence of this to the uh, of this convergence in law, and the limit solves this uh, nonlinear stochastic ODE. So this was an instance of um, of nonlinear fluctuations. So it's given by um, yeah. I mean, this is not a Gaussian process. And the interesting part that we will come across again in a minute is that we are still in this parameter. We have this parameter A still in the model. So depending if in our um, if in our uh, approximation within this critical value window, we have chosen to go a little bit above this beta equal to one case, which come corresponds to a slightly lower temperature, right? I mean, it's inverse temperature. Then, e then we see still this double well structure even here. So the, 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 this, this function here is minus the derivative of the function that I plotted here. And if, um, if this A is slightly positive, then you're attracted here to, to these wells. And then if the, um, if the A is slightly negative, which, which amounts to choosing a beta, which is slow, slightly below, uh, so beta is slightly below one, which means the temperature is slightly higher than one, then you have this nice uh, convex potential here. And um, right, is there any question? I mean, this is all recap and this, uh, this is just to warm you up and to make sure that uh, everybody is there and give everybody the time to come back from the coffee break. So I hope we're, you're ready to go. Yeah, I hear CISA nods and Milton gives me a thumbs up, good. So now um, what we want to do now is to make our life a little bit more complicated and uh, we want to reintroduce the lattice or the geometry. I mean, this was of course a bit, um, a bit brutal in this uh, mean field model that we completely uh, disregard space. And now, uh, so we, we, we put, uh, put ourselves in this, um, in this situation with this cuts easing model. And I had already explained this a little bit on Monday, but let me just go um, into it again. So uh, again, it's an easing type model, but now not everything interacts with everything. So this is the general case of an easing model where you have here the Hamiltonian, which, uh, which is parameterized by this, um, this interaction. And, uh, and here you have the Gibbs measure. And the particular thing we do in these cuts, uh, in these cuts uh, uh, model is that we choose a potential, well, I, I call it kappa subscript gamma, which only depends on the difference of the spins. And this is given by uh, taking some smooth function here um, and uh, well, rescaling it in this way. So this means that this, uh, if you think of this K as being an indicator function, which I mean, I'm not allowing because I prefer it to be smooth, but think morally, it's a good idea to think of this K as being an indicator function. Then this just means uh, this function here um, is uh, non-zero if the, if the two particles are in the same box of size uh, gamma inverse. So the, they see each other and interact with each other directly if they are a distance less than gamma inverse. Um, and this scaling prefactor gamma to the D in, prefact, uh, in, in, in front just means, uh, I mean, I want the total interaction to be of order one. So this gamma to the D plays a very similar role to this one over N that we had in the mean field model before. And what you should really think of is that this uh, means that every, I mean, every particle, let's say the, the particle here in the origin interacts with all other particles uh, it interacts actually with the um, with the mean field, but with the local mean field. So it interacts with the average of all other particles over this box. And I mean, okay, averaged according to this function k. Okay, and um, so I mean, what you see is this: uh, this is a this model is really an interpolation between the normal easing model where you have nearest neighbor interaction. So this would correspond to choosing gamma close to gamma, say uh, a one. Okay, so there. Uh, I mean, you just interact with uh, with direct nearest neighbors or next to nearest neighbors. Or, I mean, right? This is the normal easing model, or the mean field model, which corresponds to gamma equal to uh, I mean zero, if you want. I mean, so you interact with everything else, or gamma equal to uh, one over n, if you're in a box of one over n, and that corresponds to where you interact with everything. And now we are going to put ourselves in an intermediate situation here. Okay, so the. Um, and so now again, I'm going to go through some calculation with this, which are going to be um, quite similar to what we did before. Uh, and I'm going to go a little bit quicker than last time, uh, but you're going to see that everything looks extremely similar. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this Hamiltonian. And uh, okay, so again, here I'm doing nothing. This is just the definition of the Hamiltonian. And again, just like last time, the only thing I'm doing here is I write the double sum as a sum and another sum. 
And uh, this thing, I'm, as I said already before, I'm going to call the local mean magnetization. So this is here uh, the average of all spins around position i according to this kernel kappa gamma, okay? So, and I'm going to denote this thing by an H subscript gamma i. And um, then, right, I mean, last time with the, last time with the, with the mean field model, this was just an M. And uh, as before, we're now going to define the Glauber dynamics. So this formula is the same as what we had done before. And this is, uh, we see just as before that this defines a reversible Markov process with respect to this, uh, this Gibbs measure. And just as before, we can rewrite it in this convenient way that is already pretty much a closed formula uh, and sees in, per, in particular depends here directly on this uh, on this mean field uh, local mean field h gamma uh, rather than um, rather than on, on something more complicated um, let me just say i mean you, you remember on monday we had this discussion with this extra term of order one over n that i trashed it trashed and here now I can make my life a little bit easier. I can just make the convenient assumption that there is no self-interaction in the Hamiltonian and just define kappa to be, I can just choose a kappa, which is zero in the origin. It's just convenient. And then this term is just not there. So then the, this, this, uh, this inconvenient term that, uh, that was briefly mentioned last time, I, I just don't have it. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is now already quite nice. And you, you will see, uh, I hope the parallel to what we had done before. And uh, at the last time we looked at the mean magnetization as an observable, and the only difference is so now we're going to make a look a look a look at this uh, local mean field. Um, the difference is, of course, that while the mean magnetization of the dynamics only depended on t, here's now this extra dependence on the parameter k. Ask you a question. Of course, you can. Please do. So here you're assuming that the, the function. K gamma, K gamma is uh, non-negative or only that the integral is positive? I certainly want it to be non-negative. Okay. No, I think I want to have, uh, I want to have uh, ferromagnetic interaction. Yeah. Uh, no, it's because if, if, the, if the function may be not negative, but still the integral is positive, uh, it's like uh, globally ferromagnetic, no? Uh, right. I must admit I haven't, thought about doing that um let's for safety assume it's non-negative um but thanks for being so attentive I, I i i noticed that in this audience i don't get away with the slightest bit of stuffiness that's uh <laughs> <laughs> okay but i mean what i wanted to just say is that this h field here i mean now it depends of course on t just like the mean magnetization did last time but now you have this additional dependence on k the parameter around which we take these averages okay okay good um, so that's that. And now we're going to follow the analysis just like, like last time. And we're going to write, uh, well, let's just write this, uh, decompose it into the drift part and the martingale part. So this uh, H field, you have here the H at zero, and then you have here the, the generator acting on, the, um, acting on this observable of the field plus a martingale and very important. This is of course the a martingale, which now also depends on K. So for every K you have a different martingale because for every K your observable here is different. And um, now we can just do exactly the same calculation as we did before. So the, uh, the, we, the generator, if you act on it with, uh, act with it on this H gamma. Okay, so here you have the sum over all possible sites and then here's the jump intensity. Um, the intensity at which the, the, the particle at that side jumps with this given configuration sigma. And then here you have just the, the mean magnetization, uh, so this local average uh, around K if there's a jump at site I minus the original thing. And uh, you will see, uh, I mean, last time you remember here, we had a similar calculation. This just gave us a, a, a two over N times the sigma I. And then here now, now as you have this extra kappa dependence, you get here a minus two times this interaction kernel at i minus k times sigma i because um, sigma i. And so, I mean, you can imagine that this is, okay, I mean, it's easy to check. So just believe me that this is true. And now I'm going to plug it back in. So here I've uh, used the, the formula that we had for the CCI just as before. And this two has canceled within a half that was here. And that sigma i has gone here. And uh, there is this convolution kernel has gone here. Okay, so this is just plugging in. 
And now we just like last, um, okay, I've said just like last time, possibly too many times now already, but uh, uh, what you see is here, th these terms together just give you the uh, this local mean field around the age gamma. So in the calculation from last time, you had just the minus m here. And now this, uh, as, as there is some, uh, some dependence on the base point, you, you get this dependence on the parameter k here. And then here for the second term, you see again, sigma times sigma i is gonna be one, so I can ignore it. And then here I have just a convolution of this kappa kernel with this tunch, okay? So again, the formula looks extremely similar to what we had uh, seen yesterday. The only difference is that, so here was last time was an M and then here there was also just an M and then you could forget last time this convolution or, I mean, this was just a, um, an average but the quantity here didn't depend on N so you could forget this and here we cannot forget it. And it's actually going to be important in a minute, in a minute that it appears. And now let's continue the calculation. Oh, no, before we do that. Uh, may I bother you again? Okay, please do. So, so, so here you're assuming that the sum of k gamma is equal to one. Uh, which I wrote here, but I didn't say it. Ah, okay, right. Uh, because that is on the lattice. So if, if, if k is fixed, uh, it's difficult to be true for all the gammas, no? That's why I put a twiddle here. Uh, oh. And you have a... You have a uh, you, I did think about this, but I didn't say it. Um, yeah, I mean, the scaling here is, of course, so that it can be approximately true, but to make it exactly true, you have to scale in some more constant here, but as it might get smaller, the constant gets closer and closer to one. Yeah, I'm just, just checking because this small constant later on when you multiply by a big constant can be problematic, no? But here it's not. Okay. okay. It's, very, it's not such a small constant, it's close to one, and it's very close to one. Okay. Thanks. But I mean, I appreciate how attentive you are. Thanks. But I mean, okay. So now, now here, here we have now the, have done the predictable quadratic variation of this, uh, uh, of these martingales. Um, and this again, looks a bit similar to what we had last time. So last time we had the sum of one over N and another one over N here. And then one of the one over Ns got eaten up by this one. And the other one went up front, which meant that it was overall small. And so here, it's going to look um, a bit similar. So you have here the intensity of jumps at site I. So there's, you have to sum over all lattice sites. This, the four here is the same as before. So a, a single jump has, has absolute value two and two squared gives you four. This is where this four comes from. And uh, so here's the intensity at which you have jumps at site I, and this is then propagated to site K with this kernel and propagated to site L with this kernel. So here's a picture on, on how to see this. So here's the side I at which a jump can occur. And then, I mean, kind of the effect on the martingale at side K is through this, this convolution kernel with a, with a K and is through this convolution kernel here with L, okay? And in particular, um, I mean, later what we're going to do is we're going to look at the situation where the overall lattice system is much, much bigger than gamma inverse. I mean, gamma inverse is going to, going to go to infinity, but the overall system size is going to be much, much bigger still. So it's going to be a pretty, I mean, what you should see from this picture is that this thing is only non-zero if K and L are less than, are closer together than gamma inverse, which is going to be a pretty strict restriction if you, I mean, if you look in the grand scheme of things. So only, only uh, spins that are relatively close to each other are actually going to see each other. Okay. So now um, uh, let's again, look uh, just like before, we look at the situation where beta is close to one and according uh, just, I mean, uh, the, this, this mean field is gonna be close to zero so that this Taylor approximation is justified. So I'm just going to replace this tunch just like uh, last time by beta H gamma minus the third uh, beta cubed H gamma cubed. And then if, you, if we do that, um, I mean, this is just plugging in. We're going to have this evolution equation here. We have here, actually, I think I should have done a D here, sorry. Um, so we have, and I always forget DTs. Um, so we have here uh, this, um, I mean, this is this, uh, this is this damping term that we had also last time. This comes, this term here comes from this, but remember that the, uh, that the, the tunch was hit with a convolution with K. So we have this one here. And then uh, 
this is the remainder of our um, of our beta h gamma. So this is a uh, uh, this is a beta minus the minus one is to make up for this one. And then you have this term here gives us this one and then higher order, which is what I've ignored in the Taylor expansion. And here's the Martingale. Okay. And what you see here now, this is a bit different from what we had last time is that this thing here, um, I mean, here they don't cancel each other exactly. Last time these, uh, there was just an H, uh, an M minus an M and M minus M, we could just ignore it. And this was the only term that we have. But what we see here, which is quite nice, is that we have here the difference of a local average of H minus H, okay? So this now looks, uh, looks already a bit like a Laplacian. And that's indeed what we can do. So let me do the, let me do the rescaling for that. Um, and let me be slightly slow on that because this is something where otherwise I always get a bit confused. So we're going to put ourselves now on a discrete lattice, um, which uh, I think of originally as lattice well, as a lattice spacing one. Uh, so, uh, I, and I'm going to make it periodic. So I give myself a parameter N uh, and I just like to take it mod two N plus one, which allows me to go from minus N to plus N. It looks a little bit more symmetric. Uh, so this is my uh, this is my uh, original microscopic lattice, and now I'm going to rescale it, and I'm going to rescale it by a factor epsilon, which well, which which scales with this uh, two n plus one, but I like to keep it two because then it rescales this box of size minus n to n, it rescales it to minus one to one, which I find slightly nicer. It keeps the symmetry, um, and uh, so we are now uh, we have now this this. Uh, this discrete lattice, which we think of as an approximation of this continuous interval. And uh, now we're going to look at a rescaled quantity. So again, so this X is our rescaled quantity and the X variable here lives in our discretization of this, uh, of this interval minus one, well, of this, of this D torus. Uh, so the, uh, kind of the approximation of the continuum. So in order to obtain this thing, I rescale it to the large lattice here with this factor epsilon. I accelerate time, and I'm also going to blow up the I'm going to blow up the field. So again, last time we already had here this blowing up. There was here a n to a, an n to a quarter here, and then there was here a, um, an, a speeding up. Sorry, n to a half was here last time, and there was this n to a quarter here in the time. And now we additionally have the spatial rescaling that we want to do. Okay. Um, and then let's just uh, do the calculation. So here I have just copied on the top slide, I've copied the, 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 this is just exactly what we had just seen. So this is just pasted and copied. And here's just the, also pasted and copied from the previous slide, the rescaled quantity X that we want to do. And now let's just um, rewrite this identity here in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the coordinates of this one. So the DH becomes a delta DX, DX. And then, uh, the dt becomes the dt over alpha. Uh, here, this quantity becomes a delta. And the only thing I want to do here now, which I find, again, I like to think more in continuous, in continuous quantities than in uh, discrete quantities. So I'm going to re rewrite this, um, uh, this uh, discrete convolution that I had before. I'm going to rewrite it as a, um, as a kind of, uh, a, a continuous a, a continuous convolution, well, approximate continuous convolution by just smuggling in such a Riemann factor and then at the same time rescaling it like that. So this is just my I like I like to think it, think about it more that uh, that I now convolve in a continuous world with this approximate delta. Okay, I've done nothing, but I've just um, well, I've just uh, made things look a little bit more continuous. And then here I, I copy I copy this thing, just put the delta in front. Here we have a cubic quantity, so we have a delta cubed in front. And then here we have uh, this uh, this D martingale. And uh, let's also see what the quadratic variation of this uh, rescaled martingale is. Uh, oh, sorry, before I do that, um, I want to also see, well, this is now, this looks even more like a Laplacian that I did before. So I have now here, um, I have now here, I subtract from, I, I subtract X from a local average around X. And this is now an average. Let's have a look at which scale. So originally this was an average of scale gamma inverse, right? So the K gamma kind of corresponds to an average uh, of, uh, of on scale gamma inverse. 
And now I have rescaled everything by an epsilon. So this now, this, this capital gay kappa now becomes to an average uh, on scale uh, epsilon times gamma inverse, okay? So the epsilon I should think of as being much more, I mean, epsilon times gamma, so this would be much less than one ultimately. Uh, and then you see in order to, for this to behave like a Laplacian, you have to subtract, uh, have to divide by this quantity squared, okay? So this is, um, this is uh, what would correspond like a Laplacian, right? Is everybody okay with this? I mean, it's just like when you take a lattice approximation of the Laplacian, you divide, you divide by one over epsilon squared. Okay. Um, so we, we do that. Okay, and that gives us already all the, the quantities that we need for this drift part. And now for, the, um, for this martingale, I'm going to write the quadratic variation of these things. Uh, I'm going to do that. This is actually the, the, the quadratic variation of the original rescale thing. And the only thing that changes is that you pick up here uh, that one over, because you have rescaled the time, so you pick up a one over alpha in front here. And the other thing that I want to do is I want to, again, uh, rewrite this in terms of my, I mean, this uh, kind of average on the grid. I want to, again, write it as, a, as this um, average with these approximate deltas just by rescaling everything with an epsilon. But then I pick up an epsilon to the D factor too much. So I have this epsilon to the D in front, um, but I pick up another epsilon to the D here. Is the epsilon related to the size? Let me just perhaps be reduced a bit. And again, this is not so surprising. This is very similar to this one over n factor that we had yesterday in the mean field easing model, right? So this really corresponds to the one over n seen yesterday. Okay. So now let me take a quick break. There was a question in the chat. Is the epsilon related to the size, size of the domain? Maybe I missed it. Yes, I did say that. So let me perhaps quickly go back to that, uh, but thanks for the question. So what I do is I, um, I take my original lattice, which is of size n, I make it symmetric from minus n to n uh, in d dimensions then, and I rescale it to size one. So this, uh, I, I squeeze this back to a size uh, one and epsilon is the factor that I require, that is required to do it. Okay. Yes, so, I mean, Yes, that's, it, it is related is the answer. Perhaps, uh, I mean, again, this question is perhaps, I mean, this calculation, I'm, I'm not sure if it's so easy to follow everything line by line, but I hope uh, you will be convinced that at okay. least if you spend half an hour to follow it, you, you would be okay. Milton, you had said something? Yeah, it's just, uh, I'm not sure, but according to my computations, there is a constant in front of the Laplacian, no? It's not exactly the Laplacian. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, you've been very careful. I have an asterisk here, which addresses exactly your objective. <laughs> here, I use the scaling condition that two over d, the second moment of k is equal to one. <laughs> yeah, thanks, you're, you're pay, paying more attention. Uh, uh, I, I did think of this when preparing the slides, but, uh, uh, but I forgot to say it, yeah. Otherwise, you would pick up a constant indeed. But again, I mean, I hope you see the similarity to the, calculate, to the mean field calculation that we did before. Um, we have again to leading order. We have something that looks like a PDE, and then we have here this uh, this small noise in front. Okay, and so now we want to again rescale everything so that we get some some nonlinear PDE. Then ultimately, so let's do it. So this is just a copying uh, all the the findings that we had seen. So the conclusion is that we can write the the dx here. Here, this is just collecting all the prefactors that I had. This is the I mean, right, I mean, this is uh, the delta squared that you picked up because of the nonlinearity, because nonlinearity would a priori be smaller. And then you had a one over alpha from the rescaling in time. And then here we have this thing for the quadratic variation. And let me also just note immediately that here is the only uh, term in this whole calculation where the dimension actually matters. The dimension here matters because I picked up, I mean, it's really the same as the one over n that we had before. Uh, which was the number of particles. And this is sort of here, the number of particles here, okay? So the more, the more particles uh, we have, the smaller the prefactor here gets. And then you get the one over delta squared from blowing it up by one over delta, and then this one over alpha from letting time, time run faster, okay? And there's this other thing here that we already had also in the mean field calculation last time is this uh, difference from the, the, the temperature. I mean, how far are you away from this critical value one? And it's again blown up by, a, by an alpha. 
So first of all, let's make sure that all these um, that all these uh, yellow factors here are are one because that's what we want to do in order to get some non-trivial limit. And then if you sit down for five minutes and uh, or if or if or or if you're quicker than me, um, then you will come up with this uh, identity down here. So you have to choose these in a very specific way, but it can be done. So you have to choose alpha uh, according to this and delta according to that and epsilon according to that. Okay, and then then you get that all of these prefactors are are of order one. That seems not so unsen unsensible. So let me actually just sort of here I have um, has just uh, evaluated this for a couple of dimensions. So this is just copied from the previous slide. So here are all these scaling relations that we need. In one dimension, this means that we have to um, accelerate time with an alpha to the uh, like gamma to the two third. Here, this is the blow up of the quantity like that gamma to a third. And here, the the rescaling goes like that. And again, now let's just in, in pic picture what does this mean. So this means we measure everything in terms of the interaction range, which is gamma inverse here. And this means the total system size, which is epsilon inverse. So coming back to the question that was just asked. So the system size goes like gamma to the minus four third. Okay. So it means that the, that the, uh, that the system, of course, the, the ratio between this interaction range and the system size goes to, goes to zero, but possibly not so crazy fast. So the system is, is, is of course, much bigger than it, but perhaps not so much bigger. And in two dimensions, the scaling already looks a bit different. So here, this uh, the interaction range again is gamma inverse. Everything is measured in terms of this inverse interaction range. Uh, the system size, epsilon goes like gamma. Uh, so, so the system size like goes like gamma to the minus two. Um, we have to blow everything up here with a one over gamma, and the time we have to accelerate with a one over gamma squared. In three dimensions, it's uh, it's even more. So the the, the ratio kind of between system size and the uh, and the uh, interaction range becomes even even bigger. So again, interaction range is gamma inverse, and the system size is gamma to the minus four. We have to blow up things a bit more, and we have to accelerate time a lot more. And what happens in four dimensions? Well, I mean, in four dimensions, right? It's we're screwed because nothing works. We have we have to divide by zero. So this is uh, something clearly goes wrong in four dimensions. I mean, I've just evaluated a couple of fractions here, so I hope. Uh... Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so now this is the this is the question. Yes, please. Um, so I'm just wondering if if you um, if you so these are somehow the correct choices of parameters for the. Um, uh, for the equation that you've ended up with, but if you took, if you make the say the interaction range much bigger than this, mm -hmm. expect to sort of recover the mean field behavior. Would it look effectively like the complete graph, um, or I mean, would there be sort of no uh, no way to see something non-trivial? I mean, my, my guess would somehow be that if you know, if if you're always interacting with say a quarter of the system. Then you you should effectively just see behavior like the complete graph. But I'm wondering if that's yeah. I think one can do that. I haven't checked it, but I, I would be I would assume one can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um. So now uh, the next uh, th the next parameter that we still have to choose here is the is this uh, temperature. So we had here this prefactor beta minus one. So one was this uh, mean field critical temperature, which this 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 being a one is really the relies on the fact that I have chosen that the sum over my case is equal to one. That's that's where you see that one. And uh, this was of course with the one over alpha from this um, from this uh, acceleration of time. And again, just like uh, just like uh, what we did uh, last time, this would suggest to choose the the uh, the temperature in some sort of critical window around one. Okay. And we will actually see towards the end of this lecture that this is almost true. But we will need a, actually a small correction here, which uh, uh, because of the renormalization of the limiting equation. Okay, but uh, I will come back to that in um, in a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> so this is um, this is just actually the, the 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 summary. So we would guess now that assuming we'd make all of those choices and everything else, then we would guess that we get as a limiting object we get somehow 
uh, this SPDE. So I have just written here the time derivative. We have some Laplacian. Here's the shift of the um, here's the shift of the of the temperature away from one. Here's the cubic term and the noise here. I just denoted by psi, and this is going to be space time white noise. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the next slides and tell you what this actually all of this actually means. Uh, but uh, roughly speaking, this is a noise term that is, uh, I mean, has, has zero correlation length. And this corresponds to the fact that we had already seen before here in, in, in my slide. Oh, wait, sorry for going back. So in this slide here, we had already seen that only spins interact with each other. I mean, this noise, they only interact with each other directly when the spin sites are closer than gamma inverse. But now on this big lattice on which I see, this is actually, this goes to zero if you rescale everything by epsilon. So you have to have in this, uh, in this uh, if you do things in this way, a delta correlated noise in the, in the limit. So now this is sort of the end of this e of this uh, cuts easing this, uh, story for now. And now I'm going to just uh, make a shift of gear and talk actually about this limiting object a bit and what does this even mean? And um, I mean, now we want to prove, I mean, we want to ideally prove convergence to this thing. So now let's understand for a moment what this even means. Milton. Yeah. At some point you said uh, that you were discarding terms. So when you, uh, when you do the ta uh, hyperbolic tangent approximation, for example, mm -hmm. so you use, in particular, you discard, for example, something of order X to the five or something like that. Uh, so that is uh, like small, small, or is it small only after some stochastic cancellations? Ah, good question. That's different in dimension two or three. In dimension two, it's immediately small. It's very easy because you, uh, um, uh, <laughs> it, I mean, the, the, the question, uh, it, it's small in dimension two, it's small after five minutes of work. And in dimension three, it's small after two months of work. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that, does that answer the question? <laughs> okay. So now let's um, let's go to the uh, to the other side, and this is just a, a primer. And I'm, I apologize for people who know all of this stuff very well. Um, so now let's let's tell the story a bit from the from the other side. So this is now this uh, this continuum phi to the four theory, and I'm not going to start with the dynamics. I'm actually going to start with the the equilibrium measure here, just like with the cuts easing model, where I started with the equilibrium measure and then defined some Glauber dynamics. I'm going to do the same thing here in continuum, and I'm going to first start with the continuum model. And so the continuum model is, uh, I mean, this phi to the four theory should be a measure on probability distributions on functions, or I mean, really it's going to be a, function, a measure on, on Schwarz distributions, but um, okay. And, and at least completely formally, this is given by this expression here. So you, you're looking at a, a random function phi, and for each function, you take this Gibbs factor if you want, and the Gibbs factor has two terms. You have uh, such an interaction term. So you like the gradient to be small, gradient squared to be small, and you like this, uh, you like here this phi to the four term to be this small. And of course, and of course, you could allow you first have some parameter. You could put a parameter g here in front, and you could also put a quadratic term that you that um, you know basically be forced to do that in a minute anyway. So I might as well just do it right away. Um, and uh, okay, I mean, what does this actually mean? I mean, I have I have here this uh, this uh, this product Lebesgue measure that I'm um, that uh, I'm. Uh, that, that, that doesn't make sense in the limit, but the, the interpretation of this thing should just be as you take your favorite discretization of the lattice. So let's take uh, of this domain. So let's just take this lattice approximation. Then on the lattice approximation, you take your five favorite discretization of the discrete gradient and its, uh, and its square, let's say some nearest neighbor uh, thing. Um, and then you take this uh, Riemann sum, which approximates this, and you do the same Riemann sum approximation to this. And okay, if you had also such a quadratic term, you would do the same thing. You take here this uh, product measure now over finitely many lattice points. So this is now a legal object. I'm, I'm allowed to write this down. And uh, so for any finite epsilon, I can, I'm perfectly entitled to write that down. That's, that's perfectly fine. And then the question is, of course, does this thing have a meaningful limit as epsilon goes to zero? And this is called the ultraviolet limit in this jargon of, uh, of constructive field theory. And um, so the answer is that this is a little bit tricky. And again, I mean, I, I hope I'm not boring and I, boring people too much here. Um, so the, the answer is that this, the, if this is possible, depends on the spatial dimension. So in, in one dimension, there's absolutely no problem whatsoever. Um, 
the, uh, the and the limit has a very explicit form, so it can just be written as this uh, this measure of this form here. So you have an e to the minus phi to the four. This just goes over an interval, and here you have um, if, if you want basically Wiener measure. So this is a discretization of Brownian motion. And so you can write this as a as a measure with which has this density with respect to Brownian motion. Um, I'm, I'm neglecting here a little bit of boundary values, so I'm, I'm not quite precise about what boundary values I choose. But if, for example, I chose to uh, to pin the field phi at one side as the leftmost side, then it would really be exactly Brownian motion here. If I make some other choice on boundary values, then this is uh, slightly different, but morally it's the same. Um, and right, I mean, you have this kind of Feynman cuts type transformation from a Brownian motion. So this is in particular actually a solution of an SDE. Um, and in two and three dimensions, the question is much harder. Uh, so you, in two and three dimensions, you, um, the answer is you cannot just, uh, just directly take the limit of this thing as epsilon goes to zero. You have to do a, do a procedure which is called renormalization, which means that you have to add this massive term here. So this is, um, this, I mean, I have already introduced such a quadratic term uh, last um, uh, on the previous slide. But now what you have to do here is you have to make uh, put an, an epsilon dependent counter term. So C, uh, C epsilon and how, and this will diverge as epsilon goes to zero, but how fast that diverges depends on the dimension. And in two dimension, this uh, diverges logarithmically. And in three dimensions, it's a bit harder. So it diverges like one over epsilon, and you have even a logarithmically subdivergent term here. So one has to be a bit more careful with this with this analysis. And in four dimensions, so this is the um, this is uh, here comes back the the four dimension that we had already seen in our scaling calculation just a minute ago for the uh, for the cuts easing. Actually, there's a tri there are triviality results. So this is um, uh, the the results state something along the lines like whatever coefficients you take here, or however you want to renormalize this, if you if you have a limit, it's always going to be Gaussian. So you cannot get something, you, you cannot get something interesting. And this is uh, in, in dimension bigger than four, this is class, classical, was proved in the in the 80s. And this uh, result in, uh, in, in four dimension was sort of like a big breakthrough, which happened, I think it was on the archive around December 2019. And I've just seen earlier today that last year it appeared in Annals of Math. So this is, um, uh, pretty re this is pretty recent actually um uh and i mean okay um again i mean i I'm, 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 i find it a bit hard to judge the audience so either you have seen this already 500 million times and you're telling me that i'm boring you to death or you have never seen it and you think that oh my god you're, this is crazy because you put this counter term you're changing everything i mean what does this if does this even tell me anything um, and I'm, I would like to gauge sort of where I am with this audience. <laughs> I mean, there's a bit of a continuous spectrum and I pre presume the answer is uh, different for every person, but uh, is it more on the, I'm boring you to death side or is it more on the, what, on the, what the hell are you doing side? I don't think anyone's bored. More on the what the hell side. Second option, the what the hell. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I like the what the hell because let me let me um let me address the what the hell. I mean, this is actually I think actually okay again. I mean, if people if people get used to stuff, right? I mean, if you. Uh, if you've been working for the, for 20, 20 years or so, then uh, then 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 this this seems like of course it's like that. But um, I think also when one sees this for the first time, you get a bit shocked and you 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 think, I mean, if I'm allowed to subtract these infinite terms, then I'm basically allowed to do everything. I mean, what does this even mean anymore? And um, then the more you work with it, you realize that it's a miracle that you get away with something so minor as just as subtracting a single infinite term. <laughs> So in a sense, it's a, it, life could be much worse. A single infinite term is actually pretty, uh, pretty okay. Um, that's the okay. That's that's possibly not a very convincing answer to uh, to the what the hell. Um, but I will have a slightly more convincing answer. I hope uh, at the end when I relate this back to this cuts easing picture um, to um, to uh, to tell you that this is actually really not something so scary to do. Okay. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. I'd just like to understand the role of four. I mean, would you have a five five theory or three six? I mean, why do you take four and why is uh, 
What's the role of four? I mean, um, the... um, I mean, well, it dep depends on where you come from. So this, uh, this, uh, this. I mean, um, the the answer to that question depends on where you come from. If you come from constructive field theory, or if you come from the cuts easing model, like we just did. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to answer it in both contexts in the next two slides. So perhaps you just give me a few minutes if that's all right. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. But yes, of course. Um, but let's uh, let's go to the let's then go perhaps to this constructive field theory motivation. So um, so the, the the question of defining this thing, uh, I mean, this has a name. It's called the uh, the Euclidean phi to the four quantum field theory and. I mean, phi to the four is not something particularly original. It's just because the most interesting term is phi to the four in the theory. Okay, so that's what gives the name to the to the theory. Um, and this was studied in uh, intensively at the question of can you make sense of it? Can you even can you construct it? What properties does it have? Uh, was studied a lot and actually a long time ago, so in the sixties and seventies. Um, Perhaps let me just remind you, I have a lot of references in the back of these slides, so you can look them up. I did not go through a complete list of references for, for this because this is infinite, but you can, as a starting point, I have here this book, the reference for the, this book by Glim and Jaffe in the appendix. And that's a good starting point. So if you're interested in the, in the story of this and, uh, and, and reading more references, then I think it's, it's good to look at that. Um, and here the question was, um, uh, I mean, this, this, this. Here, the question came really from from constructive field from field theory. So the the task was, I mean, uh, field theory was extremely uh, quantum electrodynamics was extremely successful in uh, in describing by matter on its smaller scales. But there was no rigorous mathematical foundation, and one path of uh, towards constructing such field theories rigorously leads through the construction of these these type of measures. Okay, but not necessarily. I mean, this is a, this is a toy model for such a measure, and here the answer to fi why phi to the four was what's so special about phi to the four. The answer is well, phi to the four is the first thing that's not Gaussian, right? I mean, you write something quadratic would be you give you a Gaussian. The next easiest thing you can write down after a quadratic would be phi to the four. I, mean, I think it's really as, as simple as that. That's that. I mean, it's not possibly the most satisfactory answer, but I really think it is as simple as that. Um, and uh, so the construction of this thing in three dimensions, I mean, it's again, it's been achieved now 50, almost 50 years ago, but, um, but it was, I think, really considered a major breakthrough at the, at the time. And uh, it's also been picked up again as a toy problem to, to test new methodologies. So I think there's probably at least whatever, five, six, seven, depending on how you count different proofs of the construction of this, uh, of this thing in the literature. Um, so this is sort of this uh, classical field theory approach. Now we are going to get to it from the from the easing model, um, and this is uh, uh, this is now. I mean, let me now go to the dynamics. Um, so if we are happy to accept that this phi to the four theory is a is a sensible mathematical object that we may be interested in, we may also want to look at some sort of Glauber dynamics for us, right? I mean, it's a it's something that um, I mean, even if the motivation was just to actually draw a sample from this thing on a computer, this is actually not, a, not an easy thing, right? I mean, you want to, want to draw a sample from a complicated interacting particle system or such a complicated measure, how do you actually do it? And the only way that I know, but I'm happy to, to tell you, tell me, if you tell me that, there, that there's many others, I'm happy to learn about that. But sort of the only way that I would know how to, to go about this would be to run a Markov chain that uh, has this as invariant measure and run it for long enough and hope it has equilibrated, right? I mean, that's what people do with the easing model. If you want to draw, draw samples from it, you run your Glauber dynamics. And sort of the, in, in an RD, we know how to do this. If we have such a measure of form e to the minus v, uh, then we can define some reversible dynamics, which I think, would, which I would really like to see as the analog to the Glauber dynamic by just taking, um, by just taking here this gradient flow and putting on a noise, okay? Perhaps just a sign of hand. Is this something that again is boring you to death, or is uh, or what are you doing? I'm sorry, this you're very small on my screen, so it's very hard for mm. to gauge for me if I'm if I'm pitching this at the right level. I think we're okay. We're good. We're good. We're you're good. Okay, good. And tell me if I have to speed up. Um, right. So this is something that again you learn in a course in stochastic calculus, and 
this uh, SPDE that we have formally derived as the limit for cuts easing is actually exactly the same thing, just in infinite dimensions. So you have here, um, you have here kind of this noise term that we have corresponds to the DW from above, and this uh, this um, this, uh, this 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 drift term here corresponds to the gradient, if you want, that you had above. And if you think about this, this is uh, this Laplacian is some sort of gradient. Of this uh, of this kinetic energy that we had in the functional, and this uh, phi phi cube term is the uh, is the derivative of phi to the four. Okay, I mean so I mean this is actually kind of one of the funny thing when people come and uh, I mean of course in the recent year the recent years this has been studying this kind of SPDE has been very uh, has been uh, been been kind of very fashionable and people have liked to do it and then you you introduce the phi to the four SPDE and people ask you well there's a phi cubed why do you talk about phi to the four well it's because phi cubed is the derivative of phi to the four there's uh, that's that's the reason it's not deeper than that um, and uh, I mean okay I mean this now may may slight, look slightly slightly dodgy. Uh, so I've taken this infinite dimensional gradient. What does this mean? But you can again just think about it on, on ter in terms of lattice approximation, right? I mean, on, uh, you have, we had this lattice approximation for this five to the four theory, which is an honest measure of this type, right? It's, um, I mean, it is just a finite dimensional measure with some uh, with some Lebesgue with some density, and then on a lattice approximation, you can write an approximation of this type and pass to the limit. And there's also the need for renormalization. And let me just uh, perhaps do this in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So here I have again, um, I've again drawn my lattice from the, from the previous slide. And so now first question is, what actually is this, this psi on the, in this lattice approximation? So for uh, what you have to do is for each side in the lattice, you just take an independent Brownian motion and now what you do is you actually rescale it. You, you make it pretty big. So you have to rescale it with an epsilon to the minus d over two in front. Okay, so point-wise, this Brownian motion actually gets pretty big. And then this here is the is this honest um, is this honest uh, gradient of, uh, on a finite dimensional R d that you that would give you this term with the, with 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 a discrete Laplacian that corresponds to your choice of discrete gradient that you have taken. Is this okay, or am I going here? Am I, I mean, again, I really like to keep people at this point. Is this okay, or am I? Um, let me perhaps just, I mean, point one point. I will go back, go back to the previous slide on one point. So if you do this, um, going from here to here, that's just, I mean, an interesting point that one that I want to just stress. Here you have a function v, and you go to a gradient, put a gradient, so it's a gradient flow, and in this gradient, it's always important that you take a gradient flow with respect to a scalar product. The derivative of the function v would a priori be a one form, and then you have to go from the one form to a vector. And for that, you need a notion of scalar product. And what is very important for this to be, for this to be true is that you, um, uh, is, is that the, the scalar product that gives you the quadratic variation of the Brownian motion is the same as the quadratic, as the scalar product that gives you the gradient. I mean, if you don't like this in abstract terms, this just means you could put an arbitrary matrix sigma in front here and a, and a sigma to a half in front, and you would still be reversible for this uh, for the same measure. Okay, so this is the choice of scalar product, and it's exactly the same here. So here, I these are this is the canonical Brownian motion on this finite dimensional R D with respect to this scalar product. So that where you just take uh, two functions and you take this, uh, you just take this kind of a uh, two product, but you put in this this Riemann factor that makes it look like an approximation of an integral. And this epsilon to the D in the scalar product is exactly what's responsible to this minus epsilon, it is epsilon to the minus D over two here in front, okay? So this, um, is that reasonable? And then, I mean, this is also the same, uh, the same uh, scalar product that gives you the, the reasonable notion of the Laplacian here in front, okay? So this is space-time white noise, uh, or the limit of this thing here as epsilon goes to zero is space-time white noise. And let me just also say for people who are perhaps a bit, I mean, there may be some people in the audience who are a bit happier with, uh, with, with more classical uh, SPDE literature. There is, this is an approximation of space-time white noise, which I think, I hope is pretty intuitive. Um, there's another thing that you would find 
if you open, for example, the book by Da Prato and Subject, um, you would find a very different way of, um, of, uh, of, of describing this object here, the limit of this. And there you would typically find a spectral approximation. So you would typically uh, see in the, see in the there, that there would be a definition of something that they call cylindrical Brownian motion, which is this formal series here where you um, take, uh, say, this, this trigonometric, tri these trigonometric uh, functions. So this is a, if you want a Brownian a function valued or a distribution valued Brownian motion. And uh, the way it's, it's written as this infinite series and in the X coordinate, you take the spectral decomposition and Fourier series. And then for every Fourier wave vector, you take an independent Brownian motion. And uh, I mean, perhaps it's a, it's a good exercise for you if you wanted to do convince yourself that the limiting object of this and this is actually the same. That's, um, I mean, again, if, if you've uh, seen, I mean, uh, again, if you've seen this, of course, before, then this is, uh, this is uh, not very exciting. But I, I mean, I remember when I was learning this, I think these were, these were kind of very instructive exercises to, to, convince, to convince myself that this is really the same and also to actually get an intuitive understanding for what the spectral thing actually means. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm a bit lost. Um, I don't understand what was different with the infinite dimensional case because so D is fixed and and you have, I mean, I don't understand the difference between over RD and the infinite dimension analog because in both cases, I mean, um, can you explain what's different about both uh, situations? Um, infinite dimensional analog. I mean, D is fixed in the infinite dimensional analog, or it's for all D that you have. Wait, I mean, I, perhaps my choice of letter D was unfortunate. So this is, um, let me call this D here N, if you don't mind, okay? I won't do many things. So this is, this is just an, an, an uh, if you have a measure on, an, on some Rn, and uh, then, then this is true, right? So this is, this is fine. And by infinite dimensional, I mean now, uh, that I'm given some spatial dimension d, and I'm looking at functions in d variables. So phi is a function, if you want, from r d to r. Okay, and so I'm looking at a measure on functions on r d to r, or or, or some some domain, if you want. Yeah? So, uh, um, and I mean, so so. So this is, of course, an infinite dimensional space of all such functions, whereas this is a finite dimensional space, and this d here has a fundamentally different role from that n. That's okay. So, like it would be as if in the first case you were looking at the joint law of a finite number of particles, and in the second case of infinitely many particles, for example. Uh, if you want, I mean, this is just a, this is, I mean, this I would just say is a fact about STE. So, if you have an arbitrary distribution, I'm not sure if you even have to interpret them as, okay. if you have to interpret them as particles or something. This is just a measure on our end. Okay, okay. Thanks. And now I'm saying that. Then now I'm saying that, um, I mean, if you go back to my discretization here, this thing that I wrote here is also a measure on some Rn, but this n is pretty big because the n in this case is the number of lattice points x, okay? Okay. Thanks. And so this number is, of course, um, I mean, for any given choice of epsilon, because I give myself a finite domain here, this is a finite Rn, so it's perfectly applicable what I'm doing. But of course, I'm mostly interested in the limit as this uh, epsilon goes to zero. And in this case, the number of uh, this n here is going to go to infinity. Yeah. And, but I mean, of course, what all of this actually amounts to in reality, if you want to ever prove something like this, is you're going to take such a finite dimensional approximation. You're going to write things down in this finite approximation using your favorite finite dimensional result from stochastic calculus. And then it's about proving stability in the limit. So that's what I mean by the difference here. Is that sensible? Yes, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank okay. You. And so, I mean, and this is also, right? I mean, this is here for any finite epsilon, you have now, uh, for every lattice point, you have now a Brownian, have, you have an independent Brownian motion. And of course, the number of these Brownian motions is also going to diverge as epsilon goes to zero. What's the question? Okay. There yeah. Any things? There's a question in the chat too. Or is there a minus <laughs> in the exponent? Yeah, but I mean, is this exponent? Yes, there is a minus in the exponent. So point-wise, this thing explodes as the, the, the as epsilon goes to zero. I think he's talking about WT, the, the spectral effect uh, the composition. Here? Oh, this yeah. is a dot, sorry. This is a WT of X 
and this is an x yeah like usually people put a minus in front of the two pi ah, okay fine <laughs> okay but i mean does it really make a difference as some over k and z okay it doesn't make it doesn't make difference. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't object to this convention, but I don't think it makes a big difference. So everybody happy with space-time white noise? I mean, this is a bit of a scary object, right? I mean, you have to think of this limit. You have an independent Brownian motion for every lattice point. And then as the lattice size goes, uh, goes, 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 becomes finer and finer, you blow up the magnitude of these things like crazy. So it's a pretty, pretty crazy object. So nobody seems to think it's too crazy. So then let me just move on. Um, Okay, so now there's the same need for renormalization that we had in the uh, that we had in the in the lattice in the in the kind of an equilibrium that just tr translates directly also into the dynamics. And uh, let me just uh, it's it's not so surprising I presume. So you do this on the level of the lattice approximation. Uh, so here, this is the lattice approximation for the equilibrium measure. And now, if you um, if you do this trick with taking the gradient, which is a perfectly legal thing to do, of course, there is also a term that appears here, which corresponds to this renormalization, and that just gives you this extra counter term here. So this uh, quadratic term becomes a linear term, and uh, he, that diverges just the same. Okay. So now we are going to look at this is this uh, whole business of singular SPDEs. Where um, where you suddenly have these formally infinite terms in the um, in the in the equation, and but again at the moment I would just uh, take it as something not so crazy. I would just say well for any finite epsilon I'm allowed to write that down. That's fine, and uh, I'm I'm able to prove that this thing converges to something sensible as epsilon goes to zero. And let's not worry about what it means. It's just a mathematical object for now that I can define. Okay, so then I hope you're. You're happy to to accept that, and um, just as a point of reference here, so uh, convergence for this specific lattice regularizations actually has been proven in these regularizations in three dimensions by by Martin and Ma Konstantin Matetsky and uh, and by uh, Zhu and Zhu uh, a couple of years ago on AOP. Um, and so just I mean again just a, just a bit of a culture and um, and. Uh, and um, and and kind of uh, uh, where have these kind of things been looked at? So history, where has this been worked out? The the one-dimensional case where all this renormalization and all that business doesn't happen, this is super classical. So this is what typically be called the stochastic and Kahn equation, and it has been solution theory for this has been around for a num for a long time. So there's this paper, this, this Saint Fleur course that people quote a lot by Jean Walsh from the 80s or this book by the Prat and Subject that I already uh, referenced before. So this is classical and, uh, and this has been understood for a long time. Let me also here just mention in this history list, this uh, work in the physics literature by Parisi and Wu. And they actually proposed this kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, process that I have just described in the, uh, in the context of um, of, of, of Euclidean field theories, and I think they were mostly interested actually in gauge theories. But uh, this is something that people people quote a lot in this business. And the two-dimensional case has been actually open for a super long time. So it's a bit shocking because the field theory, the the the, the measure, um, had been understood in the 60s by Nelson and all these works. But these dynamics uh, took people a long time to figure out. So there were these works, for example, in the 90s using Dirichlet forms by Alberio and Röckner. Um, and it's, been, it's been, been until the early 2000s that this problem was solved by De Prato and Debussy in 2002. And okay, then I also, just because, um, I mean, I'm allowed to also quote myself every once in a while. So there was this work with Jean Christophe uh, a couple of years ago where we improved on these De Prato and Debussy technique a bit. Um, and in three dimensions, really, people didn't have a clue for a really long time. And that was the first big uh, breakthrough result that Martin proved in his work on regularity structures. And then at the same time, there were these works by, by Gubinelli, Imkela, and Perkowski. And OK, I have a couple more. So Katayi Chuk, uh, and uh, also so Jean Christophe and me, uh, and Massimiliano. So this is now pretty well understood. But this was really open for a long time, which is a bit surprising, given that the measure had been constructed in the well, in the 70s, so people understood this already super well, and there has just been this uh, this renewed uh, fashion in these in these kind of things. And um, right, so this is now the history, and I want to actually now um, go quickly through a, a scaling argument that uh, shows you. I mean, 
there was always now uh, this, this whole notion that everything works sort of very easily in dimension one and then sort of a right still in dimension two and three. And in four dimensions, everything breaks down. And I would like to just show you another scaling argument that shows you why that happens, or I mean, it suggests, suggests that something happens in dimension four. And this is actually, if you look at the scaling of the equation itself, and let me just um, do this for a moment. So space-time white noise here, which, okay, I've not formally defined, but it is the limit object of, of these approximations that I've written down. And it actually has a scaling invariance. So what you can do, you can define a rescaled version of space-time white noise where you rescale time by a factor lambda one and lambda two. And the way you define it is, I mean, this is a random distribution and you have to, I mean, rescaling of distributions, you always put the rescaling on the test function, right? So you put your test function and then what you do is you define the rescaled version of the noise by rescaling the test function in the correct way. And what is correct here means here you rescale, take the scaling that leaves L1 in, uh, L infinity invariant. So you have to put the scaling that leaves L1 invariant on the test function. Um, so this is just the definition of rescaled noise. And then you can actually show, it's not very hard once you write down the definition of this, which I haven't, um, that this rescale space time white noise has this uh, invariance in law. So you rescale time by a lambda one and you put the same lambda to one to a half in front and you rescale space by lambda two and you put the same lambda two to the D over two for each dimension one in front. Then you get an object which has the same, which is the same in law. I mean, this is not very surprising. This is a Gaussian random distribution and you only have to check that the covariance does the right thing and, and, and it does. And let me just quickly repair, compare that to something that you're, of course, all well familiar with. If you take Brownian motion and you rescale Brownian motion by a, by a lambda, and the, then you um, multiply this with a lambda now to a minus a half, then you recover originally uh, the, the cover of Brownian motion again, OK? And white noise, you should think of as being the derivative of Brownian motion. And you kind of get this scaling relation by just formally taking the derivative of this. So I take a derivative here, and then this lambda goes front, so from this lambda to minus half, it goes to lambda to a plus a half. And this is exactly this time time uh, time thing that you have here, okay? So it's, um, I mean, I, I hope this is not shocking that you have the same kind of uh, behavior for all the spatial dimensions on top. And now, if you uh, plug this into the linear stochastic heat equation, you can, uh, can immediately work out uh, a scaling invariance also for that. So this is the the linear equation without any without any nonlinear uh, linear equation without nonlinearities. Yeah. So I'm going to rescale uh, again, blow it up by a factor lambda to the alpha. I I, I I express everything in terms of the scaling of x, and I rescale time. Uh, I rescale the noise here such that this preserves. This is again a white noise according to what I'd seen on the previous slide, and then you can check that um, that you have uh, that that this uh, rescale thing satisfies this law with these exponents, lambda to the beta minus two. So beta, you should be chosen with two. And then here you get um, how you have to choose your alpha. And uh, what this tells you is, I mean, if you want to have a scale invariance, you have to choose beta equal to two, which is not very surprising because this is just parabolic scaling, right? I mean, if you accelerate, if you blow up X by, by lambda, then you better blow up time by lambda squared. So this is not surprising. Um, and the inter more interesting part is this prefactor, this alpha here. So for alpha, if you want to have perfect scale invariance, you have to choose a d over 2 minus 1. And let me here have evaluated this quantity for dimensions 1, 2, 3. And so in one dimension, this gives always with a minus, it gives you a half here. Um, and in two dimensions, 0. And in three dimensions, minus a half. And these numbers are important, actually, for the analysis of these things. This, uh, uh, in, in the business that we play in SPDEs, this is actually the regularity of the objects. And um, this is perhaps a question to RG people in the audience. And, and I think in RG, in a renormalization group, this uh, quantity is called the dimension, which I find a bit confusing, at least for me, because there is something, I mean, there is also physical dimension, but uh, okay, anyway. I think Roland was in the audience. Uh, do you agree with me calling this dimension in RG? I don't think he was here this morning. He had to give his own, uh... Many course. Ah, okay. Well, okay. If he's uh, busy, then okay. Okay. Anyway, so these these numbers are these numbers are important here. But I mean, anyway. So uh, so so this this Gaussian object has a perfect scale invariance if you um, if you uh, make if you make these choices here. All right. So 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 this is this scaling, and now let's um, 
let's go to the nonlinear equation. So this is now the, the this Ellen I, I think now it's working, that. right? So now, now I hear you. <laughs> uh, sorry for that. Well, uh, you ask about dimension. I, I, I think uh, people would call it the scaling dimension. Okay, which fine. is not the same as the dimension. I agree because that's okay. Let's call it scaling dimension. Uh, good. I, I mean, I would call it the regularity anyway. Um, and now let's do the same thing for the uh, for the nonlinear equation. So we um, uh, we we take this equation, and I mean, a priori, we don't expect to have a perfect scale invariance because we had a priori just two parameters to play with, and now we have to balance too many terms. So there's, I mean, there's there's no reason why we could could achieve that, and indeed we can't in general. So I'm going to just do the same scaling that we just did in the linear case, and then this uh, nonlinear term will in general not uh, not be uh, sorry. Uh, the nonlinear term will not be perfectly scale invariance, but you pick up this prefactor here, this lambda to the four minus d. And uh, I mean, here you see immediately why something happens in dimension four. So in all of these uh, in all of these solution theories, a la regularity structure, and I think that's um, and I would claim that this is also true in, in other other approaches to phi to the four. It's very important that as you zoom in on smaller and smaller scales where you're dealing that uh, when smaller scales correspond to choosing lambda smaller and smaller, and the idea is that on smaller scales, this term becomes less and less important. And, uh, and this is true is as long as, uh, as D is less than strictly less than four. And ultimately, uh, this is really, um, I, I think the reason, uh, the, the, the philosophical reason why all of these theories actually work. So. Uh, um, all, all of them ultimately rely on a very sophisticated sort of Taylor approximation, if you want, in the in the noise of the solution, which then you can trunc can truncate after a certain number of terms. And I'm going to explain this in much more detail next time. And uh, but but this whole Taylor approximation only makes sense if you think that you're dealing with a perturbation of the linear linear thing. And this is only true in dimensions one, two, three, or I mean, if you're Happy to pretend there's some such a thing as fractional dimensions. You can actually do it up to four, up to up to dimensions strictly less than four. Um, but I mean, here's another instance of where something goes wrong in four dimensions. And I think it's actually quite nice that, I mean, here you see this 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 bit that's special about four dimensions in the in the scaling just of the limiting equation. But uh, this also came up very naturally in this analysis of the cuts easing model that we did uh, earlier in this lecture. So that's a, that's, a, that's a level of consistency here. And again, I mean, four dimensions is, is critical where we would have here a perfect scale invariance. So a priori, we might think that's great, but it, uh, it's not because then uh, everything breaks down and we have a triviality. So there's uh, nothing interesting happening. I mean, there is no interesting object. All right, um, so this is, uh, this is that. And now I want to actually, just to, to wrap this up, I'm going slightly quicker than I had thought. Actually. So I want to just, uh, as a question. Uh, so, so we're talking. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, triviality, but uh, in the reference you showed us, uh, it, it was about triviality of the measure. So, what about triviality of the equation? Oh, good question. I don't know, and I wouldn't even know how to go about that. I mean, as you know, there are these works for KPZ that look at things like that in two dimensions, but they all rely very heavily, of, as you know, better than me. On the uh, on the explicit Gaussian invariant measure, and this seems harder to, for me to do here. I don't know how. I mean, I mean, this is more a question to you. Do you think you could do, say, a lattice approximation of this thing, uh, then and then leverage on the triviality of the invariant measure to get some triviality of the dynamics? No idea. No idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think it's expected to get something very interesting, but I wouldn't know how to technically go about this at all. Yeah, interesting question, but I don't, I don't know. Um, right. So now let's go back to to cuts easing as, as as the last thing I wanted to do today is to. This is just at the top here. I've just recalled all the definitions that we had on previous slides, and I'm sure you have forgotten all of them by now. So this is the the rescaled field. Let me just remind you. I take my local averages. I've uh, accelerated time. And I had um, have now accelerated so large spatial scales, and I've also blown it up. Uh, I have made this specific choice on parameters that gave me this non-trivial uh, this non-trivial um, behavior, and I had made this choice of beta, which I wanted to choose this critical one uh, plus this critical plus this uh, this small window of size alpha uh, proportional to alpha around one. 
And then we had uh, this equation, okay? This is what we had seen before. So we had uh, this discrete Laplacian and we had here this, uh, this linear term and we had here the cubic term and then we had the martingale. So this was our, that, that, that this is where we had left it off um, uh, about like 40 minutes ago. And uh, what we, for example, proved in, in two dimensions is now the, um, is now the uh, exact analog of what we had, what I had told you last time about the, about the um, mean field model. So again, I'm going to assume that the initial, uh, the initial um, uh, kind of initial distributions, which are given by taking, uh, by taking my initial fields, taking local averages, and uh, and uh, and blowing them up in the correct scale. So in two dimension, this uh, delta is just here. Uh, it's just um, it's just gamma to the one. So this is this blowing up, and I assume that this converges to some sensible initial data in a suitable space of distributions that I don't want to specify here. Um, and now what you have to do is you have to choose beta close to one, of course, but now you have exactly the same effect the renormalization that we had seen already before, right? I mean, uh, we had seen in the, uh, in the, in this, in this uh, approximation that I had that you would want to really have, um, have an extra linear term here. So you would want to have a C epsilon here or a C gamma if you want, and in two dimension, you would really want that to, to be diverge like log gamma inverse. That would be in line with the, this would be in line with the, um, uh, with the uh, approximation result on the lattice that I had shown you before. And this is indeed correct, but you, you see, what does this mean? Well, how does this translate on the level of the beta? So I have on the level of this A, I need to have this log gamma inverse, but on the level of the beta, this is actually pretty benign. I have a one, and here's this ugly log gamma correction, but it gets multiplied with an alpha, and alpha is a gamma, uh, is a gamma squared, okay? So you see, I mean, yesterday and on Monday, we had this discussion where somebody asked me if I look at very high temperature or very low temperature or something like that, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm always very much in this critical window uh, around one. It's just that I can't quite take something exactly of order gamma squared, but you have this very small log correction to it. So it's still very, very close to one that I have to zoom in. Um, but I mean, uh, this thing that looks infinite here is really a small correction to one uh, on the level of the particle system. And it's certainly, I mean, even though perhaps, I mean, if you were on the, what you're doing is completely crazy side earlier, uh, because what, what, what is this even supposed to mean an uh, infinite term in the equation, then if you translate it back here to this, uh, this easing model, it's really not so crazy. It just means that you can't quite choose your beta to be equal to one, but you just have to make this tiny shift ar around it. But it's not, I mean, it's certainly not something super scary to do. And then, I mean, important, then you still have this extra parameter A that you can play with. So you have this, uh, this logarithmic divergence uh, but it, um, uh, but uh, and but but I mean, you still have an extra parameter a that you can play with to then, then then I mean, it doesn't change anything about the convergence. And then you get uh, then indeed you get convergence to the solution of of the SPDE again with respect to the to a suitable topology that I don't want to to discuss now. Benoit has a question: Is beta larger than one in dimension two? Uh, gamma. I mean, yes, gamma is gamma, the C gamma is uh, po positive and goes to like lo goes to infinity logarithmically. Is that uh, ah, yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. So it has to be chosen a little bit bigger than one, and it's um, I mean, it's really just I mean, one beta larger than one I mean, larger. So C, C gamma is positive. Yes, C gamma is positive. I mean, C gamma is something pretty explicit actually. I mean, C gamma is something like uh, like a basically a sum over one over k squared of for k less than gamma inverse. And in two dimensions, this just diverges uh, logarithmically. I, I think the confusion may be that uh, you wrote log gamma inverse while your gamma is bigger than one, right? And log oh, gamma, gamma inverse. Goes to zero. Uh, okay, okay, it's going to zero or infinity, but okay. So I, I thought it was bigger than one, but then it's less than one. Yeah, I mean, perhaps the choice of parameters. I mean, we chose these parameters. We, we adapted our choice of parameters at the time from this uh, really nice survey, survey by, by uh, Giacomo and Presutti and, um, and uh, Lebowitz. Uh, and they they chose it. so the the interaction range is gamma inverse, which goes to infinity. And uh, the the system size is in two dimensions gamma to the minus two, and in three dimensions gamma to the minus uh, four, I think. Um, yeah. In three dimensions gamma to the minus four. So yes, it's I mean this is this is a positive the positive term that just about diverges. So Hendrik, 
Is the C gamma just the the refactor in the big renormalization of the of the cube? In two dimensions, yes. Uh, in three dimensions, you pick up exactly the same thing you do in the continuum theory, but you have a couple of order one corrections because you because you have uh, I mean you have the lattice and things are not quite as nice. Okay. But but in three dimensions, you wrote one over gamma cube, but the the log term is also there, right? Yeah, I mean this is the what I wrote here by L O for lower order. But isn't there a difference? But I mean the log term I I think would be essential to get correct, including the constants. But the lower order terms they just correspond to different coupling constants, the limiting equation, so they don't really matter. Isn't it? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. I was uh, I was being sloppy in the sense that this is the dominant term, but indeed there's another another term that you need to get, need to have in order to get a limit. Uh, right. I mean uh, uh, I think I think you're 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 reading this more precisely than I wanted to say. The, what I, the point that I just wanted to say here is that also in three dimensions it's the same situation. So this alpha in three dimension is, is very small. This gives a gamma to the six. And this one over epsilon, so the correct scale in this in this business is a uh, is um, I mean the the correct epsilon if you want is the si is the interaction range seen from the from the macroscopic layer range. So the the role of epsilon in the in the in the in the in the theory of regulatory structures here is played in this business by the ratio of macroscopic to mesoscopic. And in three dimensions, that's gamma cubed. So this is really a one over epsilon. And then you uh, pick up this extra log term in three dimensions, uh, and uh, that is the same as in the continuum theory. But you have a bunch of uh, you have two more order one constants that you wouldn't see in the continuum, which are which are error terms because you're not dealing with a nice regularization, but you have this particle of discretization. But indeed, as you say, this this is can of course all be 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 captured in the correct coupling constant. All right. So I mean, this is um, this is what I wanted to say about this one here, and I just uh, want to wrap it up here. I have this this conclusion slide, so just to to, to tell you what I told you. Um, so the uh, the the I, I uh, introduced this cuts easing model, which interpolates between mean field and the if you want the usual easing model. There you have this parameter gamma, uh, where gamma one would correspond to the usual easing one nearest neighbor easing, or, or kind of with a with a fixed interaction range, whereas gamma uh, very small would correspond to the mean field model. And the observable that we were interested in was this local mean field H. Um, and then we did the analysis of the generator and the uh, and this was extremely similar to what we had done in the mean field case, the case before. And we formally got this stochastic PDE. And uh, then I did, we did this change of gear and I told you a bit about the, the, the context and the history about this 5.4 model and this ultraviolet problem and that has been treated a lot 50 years ago. And, um, and that the, the dynamics, this, this whole theory of renormalized SPDEs is much more recent. And uh, the, the, the only last point I wanted to make here is that on the level of this cuts easing, um, the, the renormalization, the scary infinite term that you have in the equation is actually a very small shift in temperature. So it's not something so crazy at all. And uh, so I'm three minutes ahead of time, but I think I'll stop here. And uh, I'm of course, please feel free to ask questions and uh, Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, thanks, Hendrik, uh, for uh, the nice lecture. I, I wanted to ask you, so uh, yesterday we've seen this uh, observable, uh, just the magnetization, the magnetization. Today, this local average tuned with the, with the gamma, the same, uh, same parameter for the interaction. I was wondering, if you, let's say, take just the usual empirical uh, measure, the empirical average of, uh, of the spins, then you, I, I imagine you would get something like more uh, fractional type of uh, limit. Um, what you're saying, um, no, no, no. I, so what you're saying is you want to not look at local averages, but you want to look at uh, just the, 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 basically the spin field. You want to view it as distribution by just assigning, say, the value plus one, delta times plus one, or delta times minus one, is that correct? So, the empirical measure is, is what I just said, I think. Uh, like uh, taking really the empirical, uh, the empirical measure of all the spins. So uh, you assign uh, deltas to each x. Yep, and then mm. you uh, multiply the delta with a plus or minus one. Exactly. So. Sign, and then you, and then of course you have to rescale with the one over delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, exactly. Yes, uh, uh, so the answer is no, that gives you the same limit, but you have convergence in a weaker topology. 
So for the analysis, it's actually super convenient to work with this H gamma and you get convergence in a pretty decent topology. So for example, in, I mean, I didn't speak at all about topologies on distributions, but what we did, for example, with Jean Kostov is that we, we, we you get convergence in, a, in, a, in really a base of space of regularity just below zero. And uh, in the three dimensional case, we use a slightly different framework, but it's also there's also true that you get uh, the convergence um, uh, that you get uh, uh, that you get uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the convergence in, in a suitable space of regularity just below minus a half, which is the correct for the limit. And the reason why this is technically convenient to work with this is um, uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the object has the correct behavior from the limit at scales which are much bigger than the interaction range. So which are much bigger than this gamma inverse and below gamma inverse, the, they have not okay below be, be, below below zero and gamma inverse they have really nothing to do with the limiting equation and then okay below zero they don't exist um, and uh, taking this h gamma field is convenient because it kills out all this whole range of, of frequencies where the things that do something that has nothing to do with the limit so this is technically a, a, this is technically convenient now um, a posteriori you can actually use this. Um, uh, and say, well, actually, if you're happy to sacrifice the topology and only uh, have, say, if you're happy with convergence in the score hot space and time taking values in the space of distributions. So of course, space of distributions is a much weaker topology than this, than this, this negative phase of space for, for just below zero. Then you, you get that also uh, pretty easily from the result by a bit of post-processing. Okay, I see, I see. Thanks. It's technically more convenient and you get a slightly better result if you do do this, but it's not essential. And, and the reason why it's not, it's not essential is um, in the space of distribution, I mean, in a, but I mean, in the space of distribution, what you're interested in is you anyway look at local averages and you look at local averages in the space of distributions on, on with test functions, which live on scale one. And on scale one, it doesn't matter anymore if you had this small regularization at the scale, at this microscopic scale on top of it, it doesn't make a big difference anymore. I mean, you've only regularized on scales which are much, much smaller than one. And the test function basically doesn't see that. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Hi, I have a question. Um, it seems from the, in the cuts easing model, the PDE that you had, that you derived had an extra capital A X T term in it. Sorry, is which, that, uh, which term do you mean? There's a plus capital A X, X T term in that derivation. It's on slide 15. This one here. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, in the 5-4 model, it seems that this term was, did not appear in the derivation. Ah, yeah, this is a, the poss was possibly a slight sloppy, sloppiness that I had. I mean, first of all, in the limit, this is a regularization on a scale that goes to zero. This is the same as, this is the same as what I just said. So this is a regularization term, um, but this disappears in the limit. So this, appro this approximates a delta Dirac. So this is just a linear term in okay. AX. And mm -hmm. yes, uh, this was just, a, I think, a sloppiness in my notation because I sometimes wrote this five to the four equation with the quadratic term or corresponding with the SPDE with the linear term, and sometimes not. So you okay. should really, you should really have this this linear term, and then you can tune this linear term by choosing the a in the correct way. Right. So, so you mentioned you can you have this room to play with the a in this theorem. So is this theorem saying for certain values of a, this is this is the result that you have? No, I mean the the, the 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 theorem says that for every a I have such a convergence and the limit depends on a. Okay, I see. Okay, I which see. is the same actually as we had yesterday. So I insisted on this yesterday a bit in this. Uh, I have this in the beginning of my slides. So let me go to this. Uh, it's, it's really the same. So um, uh, we had this. We had this here. We had also the choice of this um, of this uh, parameter a. Um, and then depending on how we have chosen A, we get a, get a limiting equation that depends on A. And you, it's exactly such a linear term that you pick up uh, depending on if you choose this A slightly positive, so if you choose a, choose a beta slightly bigger than one or slightly below one. And this is interesting because also the, um, the, uh, the, the, the limiting dynamics actually has very different behavior depending on the value of A. So it either centers around zero or it oscillates around these, uh, around these, um, these different values. I mean, perhaps just to say, I mean, this is, I think this is an interesting, interesting point in this whole business that, uh, um, that in this 5-4 theory, you have a, a parameter in the end. I think, uh, I mean, 
Roland also alluded to that in his question that you still have this uh, order, this, 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 this parameter A that you can choose and that's a real parameter of the model. And, uh, and I mean, it, it's known to also play a role of a temperature in this, in this 5.4 model. And I think it's very nice that you derive it here by just tuning this temperature in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this cuts easing in the, in the correct way. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Hendrik again.